Okay, so uh, we'll get things going with the session on statistical physics. Uh, as a mathematician, I think I speak for a lot of us here when I say that it's nice to think of our work as having applications. Uh, and uh, we have two fantastic speakers uh, in the session. Our first speaker uh, is going to be uh, Peter Winkler. Uh, Peter, professor of mathematics and computer science at Dartmouth. He's known for his uh, many contributions to discrete maths, to theoretical computer science, uh, probability and statistical physics. And of course, I know Pete best uh, from our shared, excuse me, our shared love of uh, lovely mathematical puzzles and brain teasers, and I'm sure some of you know his two lovely books on the, on the topic. So without further ado, uh, let's have uh, Pete. After I uh, uh, volunteered to talk about DIMAX and statistical physics, I actually started to think about uh, DIMAX, what, what exactly DIMAX did for statistical physics and in particular for the, uh, for the merging of statistical physics with discrete mathematics and theoretical computer science. Um, I figure that DIMAX, th th there might be 250 papers or so in statistical physics which might not have appeared without DIMAX, but we have to remember that DIMAX doesn't write papers. I mean, people write papers. It would be very difficult to figure out exactly how much DIMAX put into each of these so many papers, and, uh, and it would be ridiculous to try to talk about 250 papers worth of, of, uh, of mathematics. So what I'm going to do is try to explain a little bit about how we got into statistical physics, um, and a few of the things that came out of it. Um, and uh, but if you'll keep in mind that it's this, you're seeing only a small piece of this picture. That would be great. All right. So this side up. I'm going to guess that this will get me. To Beautiful. Okay. Um, let's start with a little bit uh, of an experiment. So here uh, is a random placement of checkers on a checkerboard. Actually, not exactly a checkerboard, some, some grid, um, with uh, no two adjacent. So I have to say that, that uh, constructing this is not obvious. You, you don't do this by putting one piece down at a time. This is one of some huge number of possible configurations. Each one is chosen with the same probability. So this picture could have been blank, actually. It would have been a bad example, but it could have been blank. OK, so we picked something like this. Some of these are on blue squares. Some of them are on red squares. And in the next picture, I've just shown you the colors the squares that the checkers line landed on, OK? And uh, we notice that there's, there's a certain tendency for, for blue squares and red squares to cluster together. Why? Because we can't have a blue square right next to a red square, because those are forbidden adjacent checkers. So the, the closest a red square could be to a blue square as a knights move away. So let's do the following. Uh, here, is, here is one, that, that was actually one corner of a picture that, that Peter Shore and I constructed years ago. Um, although for some reason my colors have flipped to uh, uh, cyan and magenta, but we can live with that. Um, okay, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get another random set of checkers, a random set of squares, but I want to pack more in. So I'm going to do that not by force, but by persuasion. And by that I mean I'm going to introduce a number lambda bigger than one. And I'm going to reward each configuration by an extra factor of lambda in its probability for every extra checker that it has. Right? So bigger configurations now have higher probability. 
And if I run lambda up to 3.787, we see that we've now packed more checkers in and we have a, a, an enormous amount of cohesiveness between the two colors, inside each of the two colors. That's at 3.787. We run it up just a little bit more to 3.792. Something odd happens. One of the colors takes over the world. And we're just left with islands, small continents of the other color. We don't know which color will take over. It'll be either cyan or magenta in this particular case. Okay, And a lot of things have changed here. Things that are of interest to statistical physicists and have been for many years and are increasingly of interest to people in combinatorics and the theory of computing. Um, we suddenly have something called an ordered phase, right? We have a color that's taken over. We have long range correlation. That means that if we, if we pick a random checker somewhere and it's cyan, and we pick another random checker somewhere else, it's also likely to be cyan, because that tells us that cyan is the color that took over. Um, and we have something called slow mixing, which means that uh, we try to change this one checker at a time, or even many checkers at a time. It's hard to get it to change to something which is mostly magenta. OK, so we're seeing. Um, piece of a trichotomy here. And the trichotomy goes something like this. In the disordered regime, which is where we started, with what we normally expect to see with a random set of objects, um, things mix around easily. Things are very random. Uh, it's very easy to take random samples of things. Um, there isn't much correlation between one place and another place. There's high entropy. There are a lot of little objects that you can study, fine structure, and, and Gibbs measure, which is a, a very nice notion we got from statistical physics, of a probability measure with nice properties, and there's only one. That means somehow we can take the idea of a uniform probability distribution, which is everywhere in discrete mathematics, and extend it to an infinite set in a sensible, unique way. On the other hand, when we got to uh, that high value of lambda, we hit slow mixing, hard sampling, long range correlation, low entropy, infinite structures, multiple Gibbs measures, everything goes to hell. Uh, and in the middle, right at the critical point, whatever that might be, somewhere around 3.8, there's a critical point. And in there, we expect to see these intermediate behaviors. Fascinating stuff. And they got me and a lot of other people interested in these things uh, in the early 90s when Dimax was just starting up. And so what happened is that uh, uh, Jeff Kahn uh, here at Rutgers and I um, got enthusiastic about this stuff and managed to talk Dimax and the Institute for Advanced Study together into doing a, a one-year focus in uh, uh, 94 and 95 and to try to bring together people in statistical physics, with folks in the discrete mathematics and theoretical computer science community. And uh, it seemed like a logical thing, not just because we thought they had mathematical interests in common, but because we thought DIMAX was the center of the world in discrete mathematics and theoretical computer science. And Rutgers was already the center of the world in statistical physics, thanks in great measure to a faculty member in mathematics and statistics, in, in, excuse me, mathematics and physics here, Joel Leibowitz, who in three weeks is, will be running his 122nd consecutive semi-annual meeting on statistical Is that amazing? I mean, yeah. everyone here at Rutgers, two every year for 61 years, and another one starting in three weeks. And, and Joel manages these meetings himself. You know, you go to the lunch line, he'll tell you to 
no discussion of physics here. You've got to go through and get your food. And Anyway, amazing stuff. So between statistical physics and everything else being centered here at Rutgers, it was obvious to put these two things together and see what would happen. Okay. Now, it turned out that there was one key workshop that everybody remembers, okay, organized by Jennifer Chase and Dana Randall, who you'll see shortly, I hope. Um, and this workshop was brilliantly organized with uh, tutorials. So specifically, she picked Dana and, and, and uh, Jennifer picked exactly the right people to explain statistical physics to the DIMAX folks and explain combinatorics and theoretical computer science to the physics folks. It was just fantastic. Let me show you a little bit of the kind of thing that, that we saw. Okay, So on this picture, you're going to see why these two, two groups should have been together maybe from the start. Um, so what physicists call the hardcore model, actually more uh, accurately, a hardcore lattice gas, um, is exactly what we combinatorialists would call a random independent citizen graph. Okay. Um, my computer knows me well enough so that if I type in the hardcore model, <laughs> I get no porn. <laughs> The monomer dimer model, random matchings. The Potts model, random colorings. Percolation, for those of you who have heard of percolation, wonderful subject, random subgraphs. Linear polymers become self avoiding random walks. Branched polymers, favorite subject of mine, uh, random lattice trees, and uh, what physicists call the ice model, random Eulerian orientation. And there's more. So all this is the same stuff being studied by both sides with different names. Okay, so I'd like to introduce my own word, <laughs> statistical combinatorics. That is supposed to encompass what we put together here at DIMAX. Um, and it means the study of large random discrete structures, you know, including, of course, statistical physics models. Since we're combinatorials, we like ones that have hard constraints as opposed to all the stuff about energy. Energy is OK. You know. <laughs> um, the goal is understand typical behavior of random things, identify phase transitions, find efficient approximation algorithms, which turns out to be really critical, and uh, or argue convincingly, and we just start to do, start to do this, that, that there are no such efficient algorithms when, when in fact, there are no such efficient algorithms. OK, so uh, let's talk about some moments. Um, OK, in the middle of this, I tried to, to, to uh, steal Jennifer Chase and Christian Borges from Bell Labs. <laughs> Instead, they set up this whole group at Microsoft. I make the big mistake of introducing Jennifer and Christian to Lotsi Lovas. I'd been working with Lotsi at Yale, but they, they spirited them off to Redmond, Washington. And then, they applied these wonderful statistical physics methods to the study of the giant component, right? Initiated by Erdős and Rengi many years before, and they 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 really, I really felt now, oh holy smoke! For the first time, I actually understand what's happening with the giant component. We learned about critical exponents, wonderful stuff that they produced, absolutely wonderful. Okay, so uh, so here's how. The, how phase transition fits in with this business about approximability. So most of you in this room know that uh, so way back in the, in the 60s, when theoretical computer science was born, uh, we discovered that uh, a lot of decision problems were either solvable in polynomial time, or apparently not, but all the ones that weren't were equivalent so-called NP-complete problems. That was good news and bad news. And then when we started to look at problems where you calculate things, um, we discovered that most of those couldn't be solved exactly. But then there was good news. A lot of them could be solved approximately. And one of the major techniques turned out to be 
solving things by doing random sampling, often by Markov chains. And, and those are tied to the slow and fast mixing that I talked about before. So when we had a disordered regime, like in the beginning with the, uh, the checkers, we get rapid mixing, and from that, it means that we can sample efficiently, we can see what a distribution looks like, and we can count things in polynomial time. On the other hand, okay, so for example, we can show that with, with, uh, with low degree graphs, we can count independent sets approximately, but with the ordered regime, you get slow mixing, and then, I'm leaving question marks here for the moment, it seems as if in all of those cases, we couldn't find any way to approximate wealth. But for a long time, that, miss, that stage in there was kind of missing. It looked like the statistical physics approach could get us positive results that we could approximate numbers efficiently, but it didn't seem to be capable of getting negative results that we couldn't. But that started to change about 10 years ago the work of Dyer, Fries, and Jerem, and, and uh, Alan Sly, and Dora White, I don't want to put his first name there. Um, now we know that, that uh, it really is often the case that we can show that if we're in the ordered regime with, with, uh, with slow mixing, that things are really hard to do, not, not just that we're incompetent and haven't figured out how to do it. OK. Um, yeah, random three set. So it turns out that there was another wonderful um, hard constraint model, the one that we're mostly interested in in theoretical computer science, just understanding how satisfiability works. And that physical methods could be applied to these, like the cavity method. And now we understand much better how we can zero in on solutions to a set and also what solutions to set actually look like where in the regime when we have a hard time deciding whether a, a formula is satisfiable or not. Okay, so what about in the other direction? Well, we had already known of cases where uh, mathematicians have come along and proved that the physicists were right. Usually the physicists have known the answer for 50 years or more. and. Uh, the physicists have different methods. They use experiments. They use certain heuristic mathematics that works very well in practice, and without which they would be way behind where they are now. But we mathematicians like proofs. And so up until this point, maybe there were only rare instances where a mathematician could tell a physicist something he or she did not already know. But there was one which came up at, uh, at the workshop I told you about before. And the problem is this. So you remember the checkerboard. And you remember that we had this critical value of about 3.8, where everything changes. Suppose we go to three dimensions. Okay? Then there are more connections. There's even more reason why the red and the, and the blue guys should cluster. And so the critical value of lambda drops to 2.2. And the question is, what happens as the dimension keeps going up? Does it drop to 1, or does it drop all the way to 0? So we had a big fight about this at the, at the DIMAX IAS workshop. And um, so, <clears throat> so uh, uh, let's see, I think Rob Vandenberg and I, I thought it went to zero, Rob thought it went to one. And the theory is that if it goes past one, then somehow you have to see this phenomenon, even though you're, you're actually pushing your independent sets to be small instead of pushing them to be large. My argument was, yeah, there's nothing special about the, the uniform distribution. Well, in retrospect, we all know the answer to this thing, but at the time, um, Rob and I went to talk to Jennifer, and I said, Jennifer, tell Rob that it goes to zero. And Jennifer said, Rob, it goes to zero. There's nothing special about the uniform. But wait a minute, she said, 
let's call in Christian. Christian has great intuition about these things. So she brought in Christian, and Christian said it goes to one. <laughs> so what actually happened was Galvin and Kahn, 04, settled this problem with a beautiful application of some very serious deep combinatorics. They showed that it does go to zero, and they showed more or less at what speed it goes to zero even. And, and I think this woke up a lot of people in statistical physics that, first of all, these, these uh, uh, discrete mathematics theoretical computer science people are maybe smarter than we thought. <laughs> and maybe they can actually help us. Maybe we can learn things. So things are going very nicely in both directions. OK. So, uh, so let me tell you about some stuff that, uh, um, so I, I took all this excitement from our meeting and I went on sabbatical to London School of Economics, where a, a very smart former student of Bela Bolabash's named Bright, Graham Brightwell was very skeptical about statistical physics. And it took him three of the four months I was there to convince him to even look at it. And then he got totally hooked. <laughs> and uh, so, so what we decided was we would try to put all of these statistical physics models together into some mathematical framework. And the framework was going to be something that Yadik Neshatril, among others here, might love, which is graph homomorphisms. Okay? The idea is that in statistical physics, you have some, what we call it a board, like it's some representation of space, which could be a lattice in some dimensions, or a giant tree, or something. And and we want to assign what physicists would call spins to the, uh, to the vertices of this thing. And, but why not think of them as we map these vertices to a constraint graph, and the constraint graph tells us what spins are allowed to be next to one another. So that results in this definition for the sort of meta-statistical meta physics models. Okay, and um, then you can associate different probabilities to the different vertices of your, your target graph, and, and this is capable of recovering a whole bunch of models that statistical physicists have looked at, including the hardcore model that we talked about, something called the Beach model, the iceberg model, ordinary proper three colorings, one of our favorites called the Widom Rowlandson model that I'll show you some pictures of in a minute. And uh, yeah, here's some pictures. Here are three, three phases of the Widom Rowlandson model. We had this crazy idea that this is, explains nature. This is the September phase, the October phase, and the November phase. I know, they're pretty pictures. But, this is, um, but we were able to figure out which graphs cause phase transitions. And these are the ones. They're, uh, wait, hang on a minute. Too fast. Yeah. We had to give, we spent a lot of time working with these little graphs. We had to give them all one syllable name so that we wouldn't waste time pronouncing them. <laughs> I think it's the, the hinge and the wand and the gun and the key and so forth. The pipe. <laughs> this is great. But it turns out that uh, you get the phase transition on the, on the tree if and only if your target graph contains one of these guys as an induced subgraph. And uh, one, one surprise consequence out of this is, is that we were able to show that in the hardcore model and the Witter Rollinson model, you could have this bizarre situation where as you raise this, well, as you raise the stakes, you go into phase transition and then you drop out. And then you go back in again and you can do this some arbitrary odd number of times before you finally locked permanently into the, into the uh, so this is something that can't happen in the famous icing model. And many people thought that it probably couldn't happen in any of these models, but we just couldn't prove it. But it turns out you can get some very strange, bizarre behavior. Um, however, uh, all this work that we did was only for a certain special cases of something called the, what we call a Cayley tree, they call a beta lattice. Um, there's loads more work to be done, and 
what I'm going to do is put it out to you guys to solve all the rest of the problems in statistical physics and the theory of computing. So here you go. Um, please join us in solving all these great problems of the world. Do I actually have a minute to ask for questions? Yeah, questions for I've got one. All uh, right, sure ahead. This might be a very naive question. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Probably very naive, but uh, let me ask nonetheless. So in the ordered phase, mm -hmm. of, uh, the hardcore model that you're talking about, you were talking about how it's difficult to sample. That's right. Uh, could you maybe say something about what might break if you try to do it in reverse? It looks like it's mostly monochromatic. So what happens if you try and start with one of the two colors chosen uniformly at random and then trying to do global dynamics backwards? Yeah, so, so it's actually interesting uh, uh, what happens in this case. How do you get, so you might ask, I just told you that at three point, nine whatever it was, 3.89 whatever it was, is very difficult to sample. And then I put a picture on the board, which I claimed was a legitimate sample from this distribution. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, what, what Peter and I actually used to get this was the following. We started simultaneously with an all red board, so every odd square has a checker on it, and an all blue board, every even square has a checker on it. And we coupled two Markov chains with these two things in the following super efficient way. We, uh, we first generated a random configuration of blue checkers, which you do just by putting a checker on a blue square with some independent probability. And then we erased all the blue checkers in our given configuration and replaced them with the ones by, from our random sample and then do the same thing for the red checkers. And then you get an entirely new in the blue and red independent set. And you repeat this with the top guy and the bottom guy, and they start coming together, and eventually they merge. And after they merge, you have a uniform random sample. Now, there are some caveats to that. We didn't know at that time about something called coupling from the past, um, which we could have used had we not succeeded in getting them to merge. But this technique is so fast that it overcame the exponential, the supposed exponential time it would take to generate these things and got us these nice pictures. But uh, if we had tried to do them in, um, in a much bigger rectangle or with a much higher value of lambda, it would still be chugging away. <laughs> but great question. All right.